Nothing had been done if Christ had only endured a bodily death. In order to in interpose between us and God's anger and to satisfy his righteous judgment, it was necessary that he should feel the weight of divine vengeance. So the son is being damned by the father's vengeance. Hence, there is nothing strange in being said that, that when he descended into Hades. Now notice how the reformed reinterpret the patristic doctrine of Christ's descent into Hades to mean he's damned. This is so dumb, dude. And this alone ought to be enough to convince you reformed people that you're heterodox. Why do your reformers have to reinterpret what all the church fathers teach about him literally descending to Hades? Peter says he went and preached to the spirits in Hades. And you guys say, no, no, that doesn't mean that. It means he uh, uh, is preaching to people who are lost. That's what that means. Uh, and it means that uh, 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 Jesus was damned on the cross. Hence, it is nothing strange in being said that when he descended into hell, he went to Hades, not damnation, seeing that he endured the death, which is inflicted by the wicked and uh, by an angry God. It is frivolous and ridiculous to object to this. And it is being a, an absurd that an event which preceded burial should be placed after it. But even after explaining what Christ endured in the sight of man, the creed appropriately adds that the invisible judgment. So the spiritual judgment came upon Christ, according to Calvin, Charles Hodge says something very similar systematic theology volume volume two part three if christ suffered the penalty of the law he must have been suffering death eternal damnation he must have endured the same kind of sufferings as those who are cast off from god eternally and die to suffer martin luther christ suffered death the dread horror of a distressed conscience that tasted god's eternal wrath you have forsaken me for then he felt himself to be really forsaken in all things as a sinner is forsaken. Luther's works 5, 602, 605. This is the logic of penal substitution, as J.I. Packer says exactly. So look, this J.I. Packer's admitting this. This is the logic of penal substitution. Now, some Calvinists won't say this, right? I remember I brought this up in the uh, five minutes of so-called debate that I had with Matt Slick. And he said, oh, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. Have you, when have I ever said that Jesus was damned? Okay, I don't care. So you guys will just say you believe whatever you want, whatever you because so, you're not bound by anything, right? Because you guys, I'm, I'm bound by the scriptures alone. Okay, so I know some of you guys are going to say, oh, I don't believe that. But your tradition has said this. And so that's why I'm concerned with this, right? Luther, Calvin, Charles Hodge, Wayne Grudem. Here's Luther. When Jesus at the heavenly gaze, when we, so then when we gaze at the heavenly picture of Christ who descended into hell for us and was forsaken by God as one damned, that's what it means when God said, when Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we're going to look in a second over at John Damascus to see the correct way to interpret this. And John Damascus is summarizing the patristic view before him. Now, Calvinists all have this arrogant assumption. I know because I was a Calvinist that well, the church fathers, they didn't understand uh, justification and penal substitution and all that. So they were all wrong about that. Which, by the way, that's the gospel. How'd they get all that wrong? Right? So they didn't have the gospel? Really? The people who formulated the Trinity, determined the canon of Scripture, didn't have the gospel? Come on, dude. Right? Uh, Wayne Grudem says, More difficult than these three previous aspects of Jesus' pain was the pain of bearing the wrath of God. Jesus bore the guilt of our sins. As the Lord of the universe, it was poured out on Jesus the fury of God's wrath. Jesus became the object of the intense hatred of God's wrath and vengeance. Wayne Grudem, page 253-254, Bible Doctrine. Uh, R.C. Sproul says the exact same thing. It was as if Jesus heard the words, God damns you, because that's what is meant to be cursed, to be damned, under the anathema of the Father. So notice, the, they don't even realize that they're denying the Trinity, or excuse me, well, either the Trinity or they're becoming Nestorian because to be damned and to split from God would mean that there's a, a human subject undergoing this. Otherwise, the second person of the Godhead is damned. You cannot split the Trinity. You cannot have God turning his will against the Son because the Son possesses the same ontological will as the Father and the Spirit because he has the same nature. This is a denial of homoousios. And this is probably why, in many cases, some Calvinists and Reformed people have become Arians. Because there's no way to hold this view and also hold to Theotokos, that the second person of the Godhead is the single subject of all Christ's incarnate actions, including the death. 
It really was the Logos that underwent death. But it's not the damnation of the Father to the Son. The death that he underwent is the severing of his human soul from his human body so that he could descend into Hades and destroy the power of Satan in the kingdom of, of death or Hades. That's what he did. That's why the New Testament in Revelation 1 says, I am he who was dead and now I'm alive and I have the key of death and Hades. So he restores our nature. And that's why none of these people, you can't, Calvinists can never tell you why the reprobate are resurrected. Why would people who are not elect in that view, no connection to Christ. Why are they resurrected in bodies? There's no way to have a bodily resurrection apart from connection to Christ because Jesus resurrects universal human nature in his resurrection. And so if he resurrects universal human nature, then limited atonement is not true. So they realize where they would have to go if they went in that direction. So to have correct Christology is the only way to have correct soteriology. But these goobers have it backwards. They do their soteriology first, and then they, down the road, accept Nestorian or anti-Trinitarian views without knowing it. Because they think that you do soteriology first, and then squeeze your Christology into your soteriological presuppositions. John Piper, the same thing. Christ bore the eternal suffering on the cross bore the father's curse and wrath the son echoed the flames of damnation and hell he says uh, cj mahaney i don't even know who this is some other reform dude jesus was damned on the cross blah 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 let's see uh john piper again uh jesus is uh, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani that is the cry of the damned <laughs> i mean right so Hopefully you get an idea and then there's more quotes than this, but this is, should be a sufficient kind of um, selection to show that the Orthodox position and, and most Calvinists don't even know this. They, they haven't put two and two together, right? So let's look at the correct view of this. which is stated very well uh, in Exposition of the Orthodox Faith by John Damascus back in the 8th century. We're going to scroll down to the bottom where he talks about this. I, I, you know, I need, hopefully we have to keep doing this because I have recommended this so many times. This is literally probably the 100th time that I've recommended people go read this. So I guess I need to just do 100 videos making this point because no one else is going to get this point other than to constantly 